Today, banks behaving very, very badly. Hello again, it's Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics, one that is post covering finance and property news. And I'm joined by Robert Barwick from the Citizens Party. Hi, Robbie, how are you doing? Good, Martin. How are you? Yeah, I'm uh, pretty good. Uh, getting the studio sort of sorted out now. Um, <laughs> it's still a long way to go, but uh, uh, I have lots of cables around my neck still trying to get sorted out. But um, it's definitely getting very much focused now on the, some of the main issues. And look, Bad, bad banks and banks behaving badly is a critical issue. It's interesting. It's, it's the same issue here in, in the UK as well. So we're seeing uh, the moneyed power, you know, influencing behind the scenes as well as, um, you know, through the front door there in, in the back door too. But the bottom line is that real households and real businesses are being taken to the cleaners. Uh, absolutely. And... The bank we're going to talk about, we're going to single one particular bank out today here in Australia, which is um, National Australia Bank. Uh, actually, I should, as an aside, Martin, in the latest, latest round of Senate estimates, the the uh, new head of Australia Post, who is actually um, an Englishman too, he referred to it as NatWest. <laughs> but it's not NatWest, it's, it's our own National Australia Bank, and it is behaving very, very badly. That's why we, we wanted to, to do this show because it's getting right now it's getting out of control. Um, and, and what they're doing is uh, destroying, smashing, severely disrupting the productivity of towns all around Australia by aggressively um, being on this branch closure spree in total defiance of the current Senate inquiry that's underway. NAB was the one bank that refused to um, accommodate the senator's request. They politely requested all the banks to pause their branch closure plans until this issue could be properly looked at, especially the impact it is having. Right? It's one thing for for the banks to say, "Oh, yeah, this is this is um, oh, you know, we're just following our customers here. They they want to go digital, so we're following them because they don't want to use the branch anymore." So that that proposition needed to be tested, and that's what the inquiry was about. Um, but extraordinarily, uh, while the other banks found a way to accommodate that request to varying degrees, NAB just said, no way, no how. And we can see why now. It is just shocking what's happening um, out there uh, and the scale of the closures that have, they've, they're just everywhere you turn, there's another bank branch um, closing down and they're not stopping. They're just, they're just going for it as hard as they can. Um, and probably, you know why? Because um, the, the most likely reason that they're doing this so hard and, and um, uh, in this unchecked fashion is because they're trying to get ahead of whatever this Senate inquiry recommends in December when it produces its report, right? So they're, they're, they're behaving like their attitude will be, well, um, do, your, do your worst. We've shut all the branches that we wanted to shut. Yes, and the litany of branch closes, and you know, Dale Webster has been uh, highlighting these over the last few months. It just, you know, it continues and continues. It's interesting, of course, not all banks are going down the same path in terms of the aggressive closing. But I have to say that I think NAB is basically, you know, putting a finger in the air and saying, you know, we don't care. We don't care at all. We don't care about um, businesses. We don't care about local communities all we care about is uh, just getting rid of branch real estate uh, bolstering our profits as a result of that etc etc um, it really does question to my mind the cultural norms that are actually driving this behavior and, and you know it, it is not in the interests of Australian um, you know the economy Australian businesses and Australian households uh, it, it is Another agenda. It is another agenda. So last week, finder.com came out with a survey that showed 70% of Australians want bank branches. Now, that flies in the face of what the banks and the Australian Banking Association have been claiming. They've been claiming that we are like um, Pollyanna uh, dancing gaily into this digital future 
and happily leaving behind all the trappings of the past because everything's digital and it's all cool and it's all it's all uh, convenient and it's all efficient, etc. And that's all we care about. Yet this survey showed 70%, which is a landslide by anyone's measure, want bank branches. Hello, what gives? Well, this ties into the cash debate, and that's that's I think um uh Martin was seeing the fruits of the labor that we've put in for um four years now because of the cash ban campaign that we started with uh John Adams. And the that was very successful in stopping that that bill to ban cash donations over ten thousand dollars from passing. But it also put cash on the agenda, and that's continued to become a bigger and bigger issue. Um, and now everyone who complains about banks taking away cash and taking away ATMs and not 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 paying out cash, et cetera, they get a lot of publicity. The branch closures get a lot of publicity. The media actually is paying is starting to pay close attention to this because they feel the anger that's growing out there in the community. Now, I want to quote. Um, an article that was in the um, uh, the Australian newspaper this morning, actually, because ANZ has really pushed ahead with these um, cashless branches. And as we've discussed before, if they're cashless, they're not branches. <laughs> That's the, under the definition of branches in Australian law. If they're cashless, they're not branches. But, of course, APRA, the, re- the bank regulator, which is supposed to enforce that law, hasn't been enforcing the law. Dale Webster exposed that last year. So what's APRA doing? It's consulting with the with the banks now to change the definition, right? Never, ever, ever expect a bank to follow the law. Oh, my God, what a radical idea. So, no, the banks push ahead with what they're doing and the regulator comes in, okay, we're going to, if, if you're not following the definition, we're going to change it. ANZ is probably the most um, – so that all the banks have slightly different characteristics, as you know. In this regard, ANZ is the most intent on digital at all costs, essentially, right? They, they're the ones that are spruiking it. So they've, they've come up with these branches where you cannot get cash out. And some some poor young mother tried to get $3,000 out of um, an ANZ branch um, and she didn't have her card on her. And so she thought, well, I've got my ID. I'll, it's my bank. I'll go in there and get the cash over the counter. And she wasn't told they can't do it. She was told they don't do it. You can't get cash from those banks anymore. So this is this helped get attention to this. So there's a very interesting article today in The Australian by James Kirby, who's the wealth editor of The Australian. Citibank branches closing over-the-counter cash services much too soon. That's the headline. But when you read the article, that's just the editor must have changed it to much too soon. Because oh, I just want to read you some stuff, some parts, excerpts. The slide in cash usage across Australia has been well reported. But less well known is that millions of Australians still use cash every day and regard it as an important service from their local bank. And then he tells the story of this mother not being able to get out the cash from ANZ. And then he continued, clearly, the banking system would prefer a complete transfer to a cashless society. There would be more opportunities for fee coverage. There would be endless opportunity for surveillance of behaviour and presumably it would be much harder for criminals to transact. Now, he wrote that. I take exception to that. And and we discussed this, remember, Martin, four years ago, because when you use criminals' behaviour as the reason to ban something, like cash that everyone uses, what you're, you're kidding yourself, because the criminal mind is always looking for ways around the law. They don't follow the law. They're looking for ways around the law, right? And they will find a way. To to use that as an excuse is is totally fraudulent. Anyway, let me keep that. So that's my one disagreement with this article. But let me keep reading. In their defence, banks quote a statistic that cash now represents just thirteen percent of in person payments. But they will be less quick to report the RBA findings that one in four Australians say that an absence of cash would be quote a major inconvenience. Central banks have become wary of commercial banks pushing too hard on eliminating cash services. As the RBA puts it, cash remains essential in the lives of some Australians, albeit a shrinking proportion. We'll come back to that. Um, And then he quotes the Reserve Bank of New Zealand, which is something that you covered at the time. He goes, a more strident Reserve Bank of New Zealand suggests, quote, for all people, 
Cash provides choice, autonomy, and agency. And for some, it is the only form of money that they can use. And then he, end quote, and then he continues, moreover, though it is easy to lump all cash users into either Luddites or criminals, the facts of the matter challenge that view. In official survey questionnaires examining why people still use cash, the number one answer, and this answer has become progressively more dominant, is fears over cybercrime. Regular outages at major banks will also do little to engender confidence in cashless systems. And that's a very, and then it's much longer than what I've just read, but that's a very decent um, treatment of this issue. But let me come back to the to to the thing I wanted to take um, exception with. Um, oh well, not exception, but he he talks about just cash now represents just thirteen percent of in person payments. Um, now they've qualified with that in with it with that as in person. But let me let me give you this. Um, okay. I noticed the other week that the Australian Banking Association loves throwing around statistics of transactions of types of transactions by type, but as percentages of all transactions. They don't like using absolute figures. It's always percentages. And um, I got suspicious because um, uh, they use this for, for checks. And the Jim Chalmers, they, there was a there was a, 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 an event where the Treasurer Jim Chalmers spoke and announced they're going to phase out checks in Australia um, by 2030. And he said check use has plummeted. Well, and the the, the ABA had the statistics there that said um, checks were one percent of transactions in 2007, but now they're 02 percent of transactions, and that sounds like a pretty significant drop. Um, and they do the same with all. With um with all their kind of statistics, right? But anyway, so I wanted you to see this because I had seen this before. The ABA's own website has data, and what I'm highlighting here in this graph is and takes since 2007. That's the one they use for checks. That there's two types of transactions there: debit and credit, using your credit card or using some form of debit card or or um or just straight up payment. What you're seeing there is an explosion an absolute explosion in transactions in Australia since 2007. So 30 million transactions a month in 2007. This figure here with these two added together is 1.2 billion transactions a month. And a lot of that's got to do with the ease of transacting. Young people using their their phones, tapping it, phones and cards, but especially phones now, just tap, 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 tap. Remember that the ads even used to can encourage it, right? So there's just been a, a flood of more types of transactions because there's an absolute ease of doing it. And then when you look at the app, when you when then you then you look at those percentages that they say is a decline, it actually isn't a decline. Right. So um I don't know how many of these total transactions, 1.2 billion total transactions are in person, but 13% is actually a lot more transactions than people think, a hell of a lot more transactions. And that's why, that's just one reason why, Martin, there is a backlash to this that is so intense, right? It's the the, the branch closures, the, the, um, uh, the, the removing of ATMs, the, the stopping of cash payments, et cetera, people are getting sick of it. And it's reflected in that article I just read to you from The Australian today. Yeah, a couple of observations, Robert. The first is, of course, that's an aggregate average across the whole country, right? And actually, if you look at it more carefully, as I do in some of my surveys, what you discover is that the distribution of transactions are not uniformly spread across the country, right? And in fact, if you then actually overlay and how many are done with cash, there is a disproportionate number of people out from the capital cities who use cash. Why? Because it's the digital services are inefficient or non-existent uh, beyond the main areas of the country in terms of population. So 
total population uh, is growing, total transaction throughput is growing, but disproportionately the number of people in regional areas who actually are transacting and need to use cash continues to rise, which flies yes. absolutely in the face of all of the, I was going to say BS, from the Bankers Association who cases basically say it's a revolution, everyone's going digital. No, 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 right? Firstly, as the survey say, a lot of people still value the use of cash and need to use cash. But secondly, away from you know the main centres, you've got no choice because the only option is cash. And so as they turn the screws down on cash, what they're actually doing is they're strangling communities. They're strangling businesses. And essentially what they're doing is biasing their strategy more and more towards uh, a proportion of the people who live in the big urban centers who are already enjoy enjoying 5G and everything else. Right. But interestingly, I've just done some further work on this. Even in those 5G areas, in the even in those areas where there is still high digital penetration and capability, there's still a lot of people using cash, wanting to use yep. cash, needing to use cash. And guess what? When the banking systems go down, CBA to mention one, you got no choice if you want to if you want to you know do anything you have to use cash so um yeah this is a very very important object lesson and once again statistics are being thrown around to try and argue a position which is actually unsustainable well cba um had this net this big network outage last monday monday week ago and it's australia's biggest bank and it was severely disruptive this network outage um and what what did the people have to? I mean, <laughs> see, they were calling up CBA, and they were getting told over the phone. Some people were getting told if they needed money, or go borrow it from somebody. Now think about this: they're a customer of Australia's biggest bank. They need they, they the bank's online systems are down. They call the bank for help, and the bank says, "Go borrow from someone else." <laughs> Hello, what is your business, CBA? And that's, you know, like they meant a family member or whatever. Um, they People flocked to the branches to get the cash they needed. They were greeted with signs on the door warning them that there would be queues and also warning them they could get a maximum of $300 each out. Now, isn't that a need for bank branches? Doesn't that show, doesn't that illustrate the actual system here? Yeah, have fun with the technology. The, if the technology is convenient to us, we will adopt it. That's not going to be an issue. But you don't take away the backstops. You don't take away the the safety nets, the problem, the the areas that that need to be there for problem solving, especially with the vulnerabilities of this tech, digital technology. It is a vulnerable technology right um it's perfect when it works when it breaks down the consequences are dire and that's why you don't take those away but the banks in their basket are forcing pushing to take those away so let's go back to to nab when a, when nab closes a branch they send this document to the branch and to the customers explaining why they're closing the branch and i'm going to give you four here but martin you and i talked about this last year because they started doing this last year. And we made an issue of the fact that those fact sheets showed that NAB was saying 90% of the customers of the branch are registered to bank online, but the fact sheets also showed only about a quarter of those were active users, right? And it was clear the consistency of those fact sheets that 90% was their target. They'd set a quota of pressuring their staff to sign up customers to online banking regardless of whether they want it or not and the staff have testified to that effect at the these banking hearings so they've that was the that's what the bank's been doing when they reach that 90 percent target doesn't matter how many of them are act actively using online banking pull the plug close the branch well the fact sheets i'm about to show you indicate to us that they have accelerated that this is they have genuinely accelerated this process which is why dale webster question and i'm questioning 
are, are they is NAB accelerating to try and get this these closures done ahead of the the banking inquiry handing down its report um, at the end of the year? So this is this is Kilmore. Kilmore, um, uh, the Kilmore branch of NAB closed today. And have a look. Only 67% of this branch are registered for online. Of those, they claim a much higher percentage are using it, 87%. But you're talking about a little bit over 50% of the customers of this branch bank online, just a little bit over 50%. And that's pretty consistent with the other ones. I'm going to give you four. So that's 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 Kilmore. By the way, Kilmore closed today, Martin. The day it closed, NAB also announced they're going to close Kyneton, which is 40 minutes away from Kilmore. And so all the Kil all the NAB customers in Kilmore who've been waiting for the branch to close for the last few months would have been thinking, well, when it closes, I'm going to go to Kyneton. Now NAB has announced they're going to shut Kyneton, right? What the bottom line is, they don't want people to go to another branch. They want them to stop going to branches. They're happy for them to go to Australia Post. We'll come back to that. They prefer them not to go into a branch at all. That's that's NAB's wish here. So the hell, I just want to show you the consistency of this. So 67, 80, 87 there. Tachira, 65% um, registered for online banking, 84% actively use them. And you've got to question the definitions the banks use for words like active. But anyway, we'll stick with that. The Tamora branch. Oh, by the way, Tatura. Tatura is the, I think it's the home of the Murray Goulburn Dairy Company, Martin, um, which is a big dairy company in Australia. This is its last bank that it's shutting. This is, this is there's 5,000 5, people in this town. It's the large, last bank. It's the centre of the dairy industry. And NAB says they don't need to service that anymore, even though they have they brag about how much money they make out of um, agricultural industry in Australia. That's Tatura. Tamora um, in New South Wales, 65% registered, 86% of using them. So it's still roughly just a little bit over 50% actively use online banking. Doesn't matter. We'll pull the plug. And the same here for um, Gunda Guy. And there's a there's a bunch of others. The list is too long of, um, of the ones that they've been closing just in the last couple of weeks. Um, and this is part of that subset of 65 uh, this is a subset of that 65 branches that we named a few months ago as on the chopping block because the first sign that NAB is going to close a branch is it reduces hours. So they they reduced the hours of 65 branches a few months ago, and now they're move, they're mowing them all down as exactly as as um, uh, we predicted, right? But then here's the worst part. I want to show you. I want to show you these. We'll just use this this bank's figures, the Gundagai branch's figures um, uh, for this one. I might enlarge that a bit, actually, make it easier for the viewers to see. Branch visitations over the last year. Now, Martin, note how they give a range. They don't just give you the absolute figure. They give you a range. So regular visits, which is three-plus visits in a year, there's been... 366 personal bank visits and 74 business um, bank visits. Now that's three. That's anywhere from three to 11 because heavy is 12 plus. So that range is three to 11. There could be 366 customers who visited 11 times. You don't know. There was probably not quite that much, but that that is not necessarily 366 customers who only visited three times. That could be anywhere to 11 times. Heavy is 160 12 plus visits. Well, that, that's 160 people who visited up to 250 times. They, they might have visited every day the bank was open, for all you know, right? That's what that's the problem with the range. You, you're encouraged. You see that you, you, your eyes look to the 12 and the 3, and you look at the lower end of the range, but you've got to think, no, this 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 could be quite a well-used um, branch. But that's not the important bit. So I, I want to just show you Dale Webster has written this killer article um, because she caught them out big time Dale is sharp as a tack, and this is what she found. So when NAB put out this, this um, uh, fact sheet for the West Lakes branch, Dale noticed in this fact sheet, this little caveat here that hasn't been on other fact sheets. And the caveat says, visitation data measured using number of over-the-counter transactions. Oh, okay. So Dale called, Dale wrote to NAB and said, what does that mean? The upshot is this. NAB 
admitted that these figures it has been using for visits to the branch are only over-the-counter transactions. Forget the word interactions. They admitted just transactions. That is all they count. And Martin, do you know why that's all they count? They do not have someone at the bank, at all these banks, sitting there with a clicker counting who comes in and out all day. Those are the That's the data they've extracted from their computers. And their computers only register the transactions over the counter. That's all they register. And the point is, that means they're not counting all the other re- all the other visits for all the other reasons that people visit banks, and that in- they include changing signatures on accounts, putting signatures on accounts, um, you know, power of attorney stuff, settling wills, you know, all those sort of things, right? Even applying for loans, etc. And the big one. Going into the bank to solve an online banking problem. <laughs> so your online banking, you have a problem, you big screw up, you got to go to the bank to solve it. That's a growing demand for branches. None of that is counted. None of it. So here's NAB shutting down branches willy-nilly with those figures, and that is deliberate, intentional deception. They're trying to tell us there's no demand for these branches. What a load of garbage. Right, they have a yeah. digital agenda, and they're determined to force us into it. And, and Robbie, I just want to give you uh, something which I've again found in my surveys. When you have a problem with online banking or a fraudulent situation, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, the first thing the bank says is, "Go to a branch." Right, <laughs> go to a branch to solve it. When you actually are required to provide proof of identity. The bank yeah. says, go to a branch to prove it, right? Yeah. There are so many reasons why the bank processes require the presence of bank branches to do things. And yet, your point is absolutely well made, and uh, kudos to um, you know the, the, the oh. Webster <laughs> for actually driving <laughs> it so far and hard. But it's, it's clear. Yeah. They are giving you a very slanted view to support their particular view of the world to support the, their particular agenda but it is not actually accurate nor true as to the real utilization of branches and i'll make the other point you said again they are strangling branches already by reducing their opening hours which makes it harder and harder for people to get into those branches right yep. and the final point if you look at those fact sheets some of the substitute um, you know, local postal organisations um, or the outlets are not even in the same postcode. So, you know, they're, they're not actually um, saying, well, you can just pop down the street. No, you can pop down to the next town or two, right? Just to find some very basic transactions. Remember that we showed in an earlier um, piece of analysis that the pantheon of things you can do in a branch compared with what you can do in a post office is chalk and cheese. The one that we are privy to, was, which was provided by Westpac for Cooper Pedy, mm. was eight out of, out of 48 things you could do at a branch, you could do eight of those things at the post office. Yep. All right? It's not even half. Now, and I'm glad you mentioned the post office because that's the final point I wanted to make. Um, NAB is the most... Uh, enthusiastic at telling people you can use the post office, but as you said, they're not. Some of them aren't even in the same postcode. Um, but now we have another problem because the post office, Australia Post, is closing post offices. And I happen to live in the suburb of Glenroy in Melbourne. And the breaking scandal here, and everyone is reacting to it, is Australia Post is closing the Glenroy post office. And the Glenroy. So there's about um, uh, you and I have advocated a lot for the licensed post offices and they're the post offices run as small businesses by um, hardworking, you know, Australian families. But the other, there's about two thirds of post offices are licensed ones and the other ones are corporate that are that are run and staffed by Australia Post directly. So what Australia Post has done is they've lined up about 300, it looks like, corporates to close. Um, but the Glenroy Post Office is very, very busy and the local Liberal um, upper house MP here was just one of the many voices raised in very strong protest to this. And he said, hang on, 
NAB's been telling people, go to the post office. The banks have been saying, go to the post office, and now you're going to take away the post office. And um, this is this problem that Australia Post has is, you know, manifold, but the part I wanted to highlight is we know that when um, Christine Holgate was turfed out of Australia Post, uh, the first thing that the banks did who had agreed who she'd persuaded to pay $22 million a year for the bank at post service, the first thing they did is cut back on what they paid. And we know now they pay $15 million a year, which is a $7 million cut. But that's not that's that's bigger than you think because Christine Holgate said we need $22 million to cover all the infrastructure that's required to, that's required to do banking properly. So that's one of the that's one of the cost pressures that Australia Post has had to absorb. And unfortunately, the new management of Australia Post is nowhere near as visionary as Christine Holgate. Um, and why would they be after what was done to her? A genius business executive who was kicking goals at Australia Post and she was slaughtered by small-minded, despicable politicians just for political points. They slaughtered one of the greatest CEOs in Australian history who was prepared to work in a public service and she had shown that you could make Australia prof profitable by expanding services, not cutting them, and the big one was banking services, right? Um, why would any subsequent uh, CEO of Australia Post stick their neck out after what was done to Christine Holgate? So you've got a small-minded management there now. All they're interested in doing in order to remain commercial and make a profit is cutting costs. And so they're now closing branches. And believe me, if they can, they won't stop at corporates. They're going to they'll 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 be eyeing off the the um the licensed post offices, most of which are out in regional Australia as well. And imagine if those two, you know, two problems joined in a perfect storm, right? You will you will see you will see communities from one end of Australia to the other smashed by being denied the essential banking and essential posting postal services that they need. And this brings me to my final point, Martin. All this comes down to one problem. The, the, the behaviour of NAB, the, the aggression the banks are show, showing, et cetera. Um, I had, uh, before, for different reasons, I had three people in the last week in different ways say to me, the problem in Australia is the banks have too much power. they got more power than the government. And that is the nub of the problem in this country. And the reason, for instance, the post offices are in this plight and the communities are in this plight is because we've had an idea that we presented to the government for the last three years and they're too scared to go with it. The solution to all of this is a post is a public post office bank. Bring back a bank owned by the government of Australia, a people's bank, to operate through all post offices. There'll be 4,400 outlets that it can be operating through overnight, which would make it the biggest branch network in Australia bigger than all the other private banks combined because their total branch numbers in Australia are now less than 4,400. There's more post offices and branches. So you would have the biggest bank in Australia. It would be immensely popular out there. And what it would do is would break the, 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 the monopoly power or the oligopoly power of the big four banks over Australia. It would break them. And then for, for them to survive, they would have to truly start um, competing again. And it didn't, wouldn't, wouldn't matter how they did it because the essential services would be guaranteed anyway through the postal bank because banking services would be in every community and the revenue from banking services would sustain Australia Post and make sure post offices are in every community. That there is a, That is the most no-brainer solution ever conceived. Everybody without an agenda that, that, under, that learns about this is enthusiastic and embraces it. Um, the only real opposition is coming from the banks. And the governments are too cowardly to take them on, right? So I, I'm hoping that dynamic in the government's mind is changing with this regional banking Senate inquiry because the senators on that are getting a taste for taking the banks on. They forced Westpac to back down last month and Westpac reversed its decision to close eight branches. It actually reversed it out of fear of this committee. The only, <laughs> the most arrogant bank, though, is NAB. It's, it's, it's pushed, like I said, it's pushed ahead. But if the senators realize hang on this is a this is a wrestle for who is the power here should the elected government be the ultimate power in australia should the banks be the ultimate power in australia if they take seriously that it's the elected government the representatives of the people should be the ultimate power and they really take these banks on and they slaughter them in that final report and they force changes on those banks then we're going to get somewhere 
in this country. But that's a mindset that the politicians have to have. And they, they're only going to get it, by the way, from the people. If you're watching this and you agree, you keep hitting your politician about they have to stand up to the banks. Because um, there's a solution there to be had. And the only thing standing in the way is the power of the banks. Because the solution will take away their power. And I think that's why people need to be, um, yeah, renew their renew their commitment to actually solving this in that way. Yeah, I agree that uh, you need that alternative solution, and I agree that the moneyed power is the problem. Uh, and uh, you know, the fact is that banks have a lot of influence in political circles. They do a lot of lobbying. But they also have, you know, direct power as well in terms of where they choose to lend and where they choose not to lend. Yep. And of course, we've seen over the last few years a massive chasing of mortgages, um, which has inflated home prices dramatically and put a lot of people into debt now. And of course, that's coming home to roost as interest rates are rising. Right. And the reason why politicians need to take this seriously is because the economic future of Australia, and particularly in regional areas and regional communities and regional businesses, is down to the accessibility and availability of banking services. And that's everything from credit availability, and it's very hard for many businesses to get credit at the moment, uh, as, as well as other transactional services. So this is actually a lifeblood question for the future of Australia. Right. And, and so our politicians need to actually, um, you know, grab some intestinal fortitude and understand that the future of Australia is not predicated on bigger, more profitable banks, but actually banks that get back in their box and provide the range of services that ordinary Australians and businesses need across the country. And we know that those large organisations are very unlikely to do the right thing unless they are coerced. And the coercion by way of a public bank and the demonstration of how banking could be and should be, look at Kiwi Bank in New Zealand, is the way to go. I mean, these are big stakes. And the question is, will the politicians um, step up to the plate? Some have, you know, some of the senators absolutely have. But more broadly, there is still a game of chicken, I think, in Canberra. And at the moment, um, what we need to do is call that out and make sure that people understand that this is about the economic future of the country. Yep. And let me be, um, let me be uh, mysterious now, like uh, our friend John Adams. <laughs> Except you can see my face. I'm not quite as mysterious as John. Um, we are cooking some things up over the next few weeks and months. And I will break the news on this show when the, when the news is ready to be broken. But we're, we're, we're planning a way to really escalate on this question of the, the solution to this problem and taking on the power of the banks. And I mean actually escalate in, you know in, in um, political terms so we'll leave it there um what's this space but uh for now stay engaged on this issue it is red hot it's that's why it's getting the attention it's getting and we can if we can harness that anger we can actually force changes that are required maybe in steps but uh, but i'm confident that we can start to force it because this battle hasn't been waged for a long time actually it's been successful in the past. We've got to be successful again. And, um, yeah, that'll, that'll come with the help of the uh, viewers of this show. So stay tuned for the developments when and when we ask you, call on you to get involved and um, actually help the fight. Absolutely, Robbie. Well, uh, once again, thanks for your time. And, uh, you know, these are thanks, really Mark. critical, important issues. And it isn't just a political agenda. It's actually an economic agenda and a social agenda. And that's why this is so critical. We'll keep everybody uh, in the loop and informed as this battle continues. <laughs> Dale's not going away. I'm not going away. You're not going away. Right. We're going to actually, um, you know, continue to prosecute the, prosecute the case. And the point is, the more that statistics come out, the more we can reveal that, in fact, the truth is so different from the way that the banks are actually packaging the news at the moment that uh, it just, it, 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 well, it's becomes laughable, frankly. So uh, thanks for that. And uh, we'll um, <laughs> catch up uh, again soon, Robbie. Thanks, Martin. See you. Take care. See you.